Welcome to Season 5 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call, and today our topic is food security, specifically the impact of war in Ukraine on the global food supply. Dr. Josh Sharfstein speaks to William Masters, professor of food economics and policy at Tufts University. Let's listen. Professor Masters, thanks so much for joining me on Public Health on Call to talk about the war in Ukraine and its impact on the food supply around the world. Could you start by introducing yourself to our audience? Yes, thanks, uh, Josh. Thank you for hosting this. Um, so I'm William Masters. I'm a professor of food economics at the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University. Uh, I lead a big project called Food Prices for Nutrition, where we look at uh, prices around the world, the diet costs, affordability, um, very much issues of the day. So as soon as you think about Ukraine and food, what comes to your mind? Wheat, wheat and sunflower oil. So U.S. Uh, and the world agricultural system is quite highly specialized. And it turns out that region of the world just has just tremendously deep, rich soils, uh, good moisture. Wheat's a pretty high value crop. They also got specialized in, so- in uh, sunflower oil, as I said. And so those two crops, uh, they account for disproportionate share of world supplies, um, so the, the wars really hit hard uh, the wheat market, especially the places that Ukraine and Russia export to uh, in um, North Africa, the Middle East, you know, obviously proximity across um, the Black Sea, and then also the oil, uh, vegetable oil market, very important. So um, tell me more about the vegetable oil market. Where, what is that market look like? Why is that significant? So it turns out that vegetable oil even though nutritionists, public health people have kind of thought of this sort of in the background of world diets, is a very important food product, um, accounts for a significant share of consumer spending in very low-income settings. It's really important for nutrition, actually, um, for a balanced diet overall. And it's been supplied by soybean oil, corn oil, um, but also these relatively minor vegetable oils we don't always think about, like sunflower oil. So um, wheat, um, important for for bread, I guess, but maybe not just bread? Absolutely. Every culture um, is reliant on one or another basic starchy staple. And wheat has been a blockbuster for centuries. Uh, Roman Empire ran on it. And so much of North Africa, uh, obviously the Mediterranean still today, um, and, uh, and even Asia has become very, very heavily dependent on wheat, particularly wheat from Russia and Ukraine. And um, what what kind of food products does it go into? So basic bread becomes a daily staple for so many people where it's convenient, uh, quick and nutritious, a lot of protein actually, not just carbohydrates. Mm. Um, and so then there's also all of the different kinds of flatbreads and, uh, and wheat as a core ingredient of food products from pasta to all kinds of noodles across the Middle East and and even Asia. So what are the impacts that I'm I'm maybe struck by you referencing North Africa and the Middle East now a few times. What are the impacts on those regions when one of their main suppliers of wheat and sunflower oil really becomes unable to export? Yeah, you want to think of this in in sort of a time dimension, above all, where there's these short-run disruptions. Often that's what you see in the news, is something that happened from day to day, maybe week to week. So this disruption has just devastated the ability, particularly the food aid community, to source their wheat and their vegetable oil. But then in the medium run, it spreads to other commodities. And even right away it does because traders anticipate that if corn is scarce, if wheat is scarce, then corn will be scarce. If sunflower oil is scarce, then other vegetable oils prices go up. So these prices tend to go up in lockstep. 
And crucially, this happened at a time when there was a lot of pressure for higher prices for other reasons. So the main effect in the world of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the disruption to the oil markets and especially natural gas, a major supplier of the feedstock for fertilizers. And so all around the world, people are facing higher fertilizer prices. So it's a longer run effect on all food, not just this one disruption. So you've got multiple impacts on the food system and you study prices. Can you talk about what's been happening to prices? Yeah, so you've got on top of a 10, 15, 20% cumulative rise over the recent five, six, seven months in terms of major food commodities, this new uh, scarcity specifically from the outbreak of the war and sanctions against Russia, you know, adding a 10, 15, 20, depending on the time horizon exactly, uh, and the and the product, additional price rise. So, as I said, particularly devastating for the World Food Program, others trying to source large amounts of wheat, vegetable oil for food aid purposes. But then ordinary households, they're paying prices that are retail items, not the wholesale commodity. So the price rise is much smaller proportionally for the retail item, but it's much more devastating because food can be 60, 70, even 80 percent of the total expenditure for a very low income household. So talk to me about the consequences that we're seeing beyond the food system in for health, for economics in some of these countries now. Absolutely. So people will defend their total daily energy intake with their lives if they have to, sacrificing so much else in terms of long-term care for their families and uh, education and so forth, just to be able to keep eating each day. And they'll sacrifice diet quality. So when food prices rise, what we see is diet quality worsens. What we see is children kept out of school, people postponing the most basic things in order to keep eating. And you're talking about then a much longer term impact of what's happening now. Exactly. And you see the scarring on politics as countries lose faith in their governments. You know, we speak of bread riots. It's because people don't trust their government to serve their needs. Um, And these are volatile situations to begin with because of their, uh, you know, in this post-pandemic period, we hope it's a post-pandemic period or the later stages of the pandemic in which societies have had their trust in each other really shaken. So we started with wheat and sunflower oil, but we've gotten to some pretty, pretty big issues. How does the food community, the food food experts think about what possibly can be done to mitigate this really? Yeah, so the crucial question is, do world governments recognize the need to devote more financial resources to ensuring that their low-income populations have access to the foods they need and also invest in the medium longer run supply response? Because given the high prices of fertilizer, we desperately need to make sure that the pipeline of innovation and resources to farmers keeps flowing so that yields don't fall. Is there any positive movement in that direction or where would we see that discussion happening? Well, I think there's steps forward and steps backward. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good things going on. Uh, Right, you know, we tend to focus on the dangers, on the harmful things, and that's for very good reasons. But the world rice market, for example, is doing very well because India's rice harvest has been excellent. And so rice prices have not gone up. And we see people able to switch sometimes. We also see many agricultural institutions responding to the threat with lots of innovation, efforts to make farming work better with less. Um, But there are steps backwards. So things that we shouldn't be doing that we are doing, uh, for example, putting a lot of corn in our cars with this ethanol mandate that we have in the United States, having gone from 10% of gasoline to 15 over the summer, um, you know, basically for political reasons. And we have to look out for those as really harmful for the world food system. What can individuals do if they want to, you know, make a difference to uh, address 
these unfolding challenges? Is there a particular type of donation they can make or a particular kind of advocacy they should do? What, what would you recommend? Yeah, I think people have to do what they're best at and what they know about and what they care most about. And so if people care most about the very poorest in the world, then programs like the World Food Program itself, uh, but also independent nonprofit NGOs. Uh, so you can give directly through an organization literally called Give Directly that uh, supports the lowest income people in several countries. And, uh, and then, you know, within the United States, an enormous number of opportunities to support not only Ukraine directly, but communities within, within the U.S. Uh, but at the end of the day, systemic change relies on politics. It relies on paying very close attention to what's happening in terms of our upcoming existential questions about American accountability of government. Um, and so I think each person uh, you know, has an opportunity to do so many things. Uh, and the really key thing to do is do the thing you, that, you, that, you, that you know about and that you care about and that's close to, to your heart. Well, Professor Masters, thank you so much for talking to us about the situation in Ukraine and food and so much more. Thank you, Josh. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desman. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening. <laughs>